Coming out of this offseason, I truly felt that the New York Mets had the best starting rotation in the game. Now that they've lost Jose Quintana for at least the first half of the season, do I still believe this is the best rotation in baseball? We're going to discuss that on today's edition of Locked On Mets. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Eros Ryan Ficklestein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on Twitter at Ficklestein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment matter more by visiting FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. More bad news as it relates to Jose Quintana. Report today is that there was a lesion that had to be removed. It was benign. Uh, so there was, I guess, some cancer concern for Quintana. Luckily, there are no issues on that front, but... He still got surgery, a bone graft to, or was surgically repaired with a bone graft to fix his fifth rib on his left side. That's going to take him out for at least the first half of the season. Now you're looking at the earliest return being after July. Basically, what Billy Epler said was, you know, this was a decision that Quintana made. He could have opted for a rest approach, just try to let this thing heal and. That would have maybe made the timetable a little bit shorter, but that would have also made it a coin flip. This is a little more of a sure thing for him to get this surgery, but now it's a waiting game. And for Quintana, it would make sense to jump on the surgery because he's got a two-year contract and he can get himself right and hopefully come back this year. But regardless, he can return to the mound next year with the Mets and be fine. But the Mets' perspective... Obviously, it's good that he has a more of a sure thing in this recovery process. But when you're looking at this upcoming season, it's really hard to count on Quintana at all anymore. I know they're saying, hey, first half, that's fine. Look, you know, and we also saw the, the buzz quote, of course, of the uh, Buck show off to say, hey, we look at Quintana as a good trade deadline acquisition, which any Mets fan hates to hear that old saying because it feels very Wilpon esque to to look at the injured players as the reinforcements you get midseason. Jose Quintana, at this stage, is a player that you almost just have to completely wash out of your brain and just forget he's in there. And if he comes back, he comes back this year. But I'm looking at the Mets rotation right now, as is, of Verlander and Scherzer atop it. You know that, no doubt about it. Senga's your three. Everything looks fine with his fingers. So at this stage, imagine he's going to be ready Come opening day, so your front three is secured. Carrasco, we talked about him on yesterday's show. A solid number four that you can count on to make his starts every fifth day. You feel good about that. And then the fifth, sixth starter is the competition between David Peterson and Tyler McGill. And if that is what you have for a majority of the season and you don't deal with too many injuries, that six-man rotation is fine. You just have to wonder if you have to dip beyond that how much you can trust a Jose Budo, or um, you know whether it's Eliezer Hernandez's depth or Joey Lucchese. These are the options they currently have on the 40. Uh, beyond that, maybe you're looking at a guy like Dominic Hamill taking a step as a top prospect. Um, otherwise, they're going to have to look elsewhere to add arms. So for now, I think they're fine, but it's definitely bad news on Quintana, which we've been discussing and hasn't really changed too much, but now you're just even more sure that you're not going to see him until they say July. To me, I'm thinking August. Like I, I set the over under on or, or, or the date uh, of when he would return at like the trade deadline. You know, end of July, early August, and I think it'd be later than that. I just feel like by the time he gets back to himself and throwing and everything else, you're going to be looking up at four months of the season in the books. So. We'll see what happens there, but 
On the positive front, David Peterson continues to pitch exceptionally well in spring. Tyler McGill goes up, gives you four strong innings. You think, all right, does he have the inside edge on the job? There's some reporting that indicates the Mets might favor him, and they think that McGill has maybe more upside than a Quintana did in the rotation, and hey, it could be a blessing in disguise. We've seen all this stuff. Yet David Peterson just continues to carve. Four innings pitched. I get that it was against the Nationals. But he walked one, didn't give up a hit, and had five strikeouts. So now his numbers for the spring, it's six innings, it's six strikeouts, it's three walks, it's no hits. He has not given up a single hit throughout this entire spring training across now three different outings. This guy can be dominant. I really believe that. I really am getting to the point where as much as everyone wants to talk about the upside of Tyler McGill, where I'm all in the upside of David Peterson. I've I've been on this train for a while now. I was discussing him as a number three starter earlier this offseason. I still think he can reach that ceiling and reach that ceiling as soon as this year. I have felt for a long time that when we get to October and you have to roll four starters out in a playoff series, it will be Verlander, Scherzer, whichever way you want to line them up, Sanga, and then Peterson's grabbing the ball game four. I think that that is where this ends up going. I think he is the best cost-controlled starting pitcher this team has. And moving forward, I think they can count on the fact that at least for next season, you know, if Scherzer walks, which we still don't know what will happen there, it would be Verlander, Sanga, Peterson. If he sticks around, that four could be together going into next year. And I'm not concerned about this rotation moving forward because of it. So uh, a great outing by Peterson. Um, that's only going to add uh, another layer to this conversation. He threw 68 pitches. So uh, he's getting ready for opening day. I'd love to see him in that rotation. And we'll just see how they ultimately line it up uh, to start the season, whether that means McGill starting out in AAA, whether that means one of these guys in the bullpen a lot of choices the Mets had to make, but apparently they could be looking at a six-man rotation still, even without Quintana. I want to discuss that a little bit next and then get into our ultimate conversation for the day if the Mets have the best rotation in the game, even without Jose Quintana. Before we get into that, though, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. We are down to the last little bit of the NBA season ahead of the playoffs, which makes this the perfect time for you to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because new customers, they get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just down the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, it's secure, it's super easy to use. That you can bet on everything from the money line to the point scores or three pointers drain, the spread, plus FanDuel even lets you combine your bets at a, for a chance at a bigger payout. With a same game parlay. You can also look at MLB Futures. You want to bet on the Mets to win the National League East, to win the National League, to win the World Series, or you're looking at some player futures on awards. FanDuel is where you should go to get all of those different odds and to make your bets before the season. Don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000. Bonus bets back. When you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment matter more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Today, Buck Show Walter said the Mets could go to a six-man rotation this year, even without Jose Quintana. And that shows how much confidence they have in both David Peterson and Tyler McGill. Now, the benefits of a six-man rotation are obvious in the sense that you got to keep your guys healthy. You want... Verlander and Scherzer, who are both getting up there in age to be ready to go come October. And there's a lot of teams that now believe that rest is the best way to keep these guys upright. Now, those old school pitchers at times feel like the best way to be ready come October. We've heard Max Scherzer speak very openly about this is getting his work in, getting up to 200 innings pitched and, and being uh, in that type of shape when you get to those most important games. That's how he feels he can get ready. But also, if I remember correctly, when he did pitch all the way through in 2019 when the Nationals won the World Series, he was breaking down a bit at that time. So, you know, I, I think it's a balance that the Mets have to draw here. And if it means at points this season you're going to a six-man rotation to protect your two, you know, prized aces or also Kodai Senga, who 
is going to be dealing with a massive adjustment this season and you feel so good about Peterson and McGill that you want to keep everyone in that rotation, I think that is a great way to manage things. Here's where it gets a little bit complicated. If you go six-man rotation, you're probably going seven-man pen, and then you have to feel confident that all of your six starters are going to go deep enough in games because it's a lot harder to keep a long man if you have to go a man down in the bullpen because you're keeping a six-man rotation. You can't just keep on burning options on Peterson and McGill by cycling them into Syracuse anytime you want to do a turn in your six-man rotation. So the Mets do have some flexibility with those two arms in particular having options. Uh, so when it comes to the start of the season, again, you can put McGill in AAA, have him starting every fifth day, continuing to work on all the stuff that he needs to work on, which to me isn't the worst thing in the world. He's playing with a lower velocity so he can hold on to his velo deeper into games, work on it in Syracuse. You're toying with the curveball for the first time. All right, let's see what that looks like in games. I really do like the idea of Peterson starting uh, as the fifth starter and McGill in AAA with, you know, having, whether it's a Lucchese, I hate a Hernandez being in the opening day bullpen, but maybe you just go no long man. Um, even if the long man's a guy like Tommy Hunter who can give you two innings. I do like that that setup to start the year with the ability to at any point deploy a six-man rotation that includes McGill. But the fact that they are speaking so highly of McGill just leaves me grasping for straws as to what this rotation is ultimately going to look like. Here's the thing, though. Regardless of how they align it, I still believe the Mets have the best rotation in baseball, bar none. And over at JustBaseball.com, we have been doing... A ton of top 10s. My life has been rankings over the past month and a half. And honestly, I'm about sick of it because a lot of articles, a lot of podcasts, a lot we've been doing when it comes to, you know, which team is better here, which players are, are the top 10 third baseman, shortstop, all that stuff. But the maybe favorite article I've written throughout this process was top 10 rotations that I did last week. And I spoke about a little bit on my new show, Who's Better Baseball, as I at one point, compared the Mets' rotation to the Yankees' rotation. I also compared the Mariners to the Astros' rotation. These are all rotations that are in my top 10. But if you go through my list here, the honorable mentions show you how talented starting pitching is in baseball right now. you got the San Diego Padres with Hugh Darvish, Blake Snell, and Joe Musgrove, who couldn't crack my list because we don't necessarily trust a Seth Lugo as a starter or Nick Martinez, or even a Michael Walker, who does give them at least a little bit of actual starting experience compared to converted relievers in Lugo and Martinez. But they were left off. The Rangers with Jacob deGrom, they were left off because of the volatility of a guy like Jacob deGrom and Nathan Avaldi coming off injury, Andrew Heaney. If they stay healthy, maybe a top 10 rotation, but we don't know. The Miami Marlins, they have the reigning Cy Young, Sandy Alcantara, a guy that I think a lot of us think is the best pitcher in the game right now. But what do they have beyond that? When it comes to the rest of their staff, how will it get filled out? A lot of talented arms like Jesus Lazardo and Edward Cabrera who were great when on the mound last year but weren't always on the mound. And Trevor Rogers was amazing in 2021 as a rookie, runner-up in Rookie of the Year. Not great last year. Johnny Cueto pitched way above what the expected metrics would suggest last year. Is he going to be a really solid number two, number three for them? Or is he going to be pitching more like a 4-5 ERA and more like a fifth starter as opposed to being an anchor they can trust? So they ended up as an honorable mention. As we get into the top 10 here, you're going to see the difference to me between the Mets rotation and these other rotations in baseball is they have this perfect balance of high-end upside with their top three that goes right to, to the top of the list when you look at best you know, three-headed monsters in the game. Plus, the depth that was able to absorb a Jose Quintana injury and still, in my opinion, be considered the best rotation in the game. We're going to go through my top 10 list in just a minute. First, though, another word from our sponsors. Looking at the top 10 rotations in the game that I ranked for JustBaseball.com, number 10 
the Tampa Bay Rays, they have a chance to be in the best rotation in baseball, assuming they get Tyler Glasnow back healthy this year. They got some good arms. Shane McClanahan, Drew Rasmussen, Zach Eflin brought on in free agency, Jeffrey Springs. But even with all that, they have guys that did it last year but don't have as long of a track record. And I look right up top, and as much as I might like McClanahan, Rasmussen, and Eflin, or McClanahan, Rasmussen, and Springs, does not compare to Verlander, Scherzer, Sanka. You look at the Dodgers. They have some depth um, with you know Tony Gonsolin and Dustin May backing up Urias and Kershaw as the one and two. And uh, you know Noah Syndergaard's now part of that staff, but uh, they don't have the same amount of depth as the Mets. And as much as Urias is great and Kershaw can be great, the health of Kershaw is more concerning uh, than I think what I feel about Verlander Scherzer. And, you know, I, as much as I think Dustin May can be amazing, he's got to prove that at this level. You go to uh, number eight on my list, Manoa Gosman Bassett, where the Toronto Blue Jays, a very good one, two, three. I, I think that you can make the argument that Manoa Gosman is right there with Verlander Scherzer, but I think Verlander Scherzer is better. And look, Bassett Sanga. Interesting discussion when it comes to the Mets. I think the reason the Mets wet Sanga this year is because he has a higher upside than what Bassett really offered them. So instead of going with the more sure thing and spending $63 million, they go $75 million over five years instead of the three for Bassett, and they get a guy in Sanga who they think has more upside. But you go beyond that, the Blue Jays have Jose Barrios, big question mark there. Usei Kikuchi looks good in spring, but another question mark. The overall depth didn't stack up with the Mets. Go to number seven, the Phillies. Nola Wheeler Suarez. Really, really good. Aaron Nola and Zach Wheeler, I'd call that a wash with Orlando Scherzer. I'd make the argument that Suarez might even be better than Kodai Senga. But Taiwan Walker at the four, I think he's going to have a bad year this year pitching in that ballpark. Bailey Falter, not an, a fifth starter I trust. Andrew Painter has some scary injury stuff going on with his UCL. He's going to try to do the rest instead of the surgery on it. Uh, he is a, a phenom prospect that's 19 years old that was competing for a spot in the rotation before the injury. When he is up, uh, he's going to take that rotation to another level, but there's no guarantee he's going to be up this year. So he ends up uh, you know, really kind of being that escalator that might not come true, and that's why they're at seven. Six, you got the Brewers, Corbin Burns, Brendan Woodruff, Freddie Peralta. Great three, great depth with guys like Eric Lauer and Wade Miley to round out the rotation. But I, I just think that you know, Verlander Scherzer, slight edge over Burns Woodruff. Sanga Peralta. Peralta's a guy that has done it. So I'd even call that a wash. But when it comes to Lauer, Miley, and I don't know if they're going to have Aaron Ashby be a starter or a reliever this year. We'll see exactly what they do with him. But the Mets' overall depth to still have Carrasco, Peterson, McGill, I think, tops that team. You go to five with the Yankees. Big injury concerns now with Carlos Rodon potentially missing the first month of the season. Uh, that really knocked them down in our rankings, although they still weren't going to be one. And I did a whole podcast on who's better at baseball comparing the two, so you can check that out if you want to see why I believe the Mets have a better rotation than the Yankees. The Astros and Mariners come in at 4-3 and three on my list. Again, I had a full episode of that as well, who's better at baseball, comparing those two rotations in particular. I think with the Astros... Valdez, Javier, great. Step below Scherzer, Verlander, though. Luis Garcia as a three, I think, has a much more limited ceiling compared to Asenga. And beyond that, Jose Arquiti, Hunter Brown, Lance McCullers coming off an injury at some point this year. The Mets depth ultimately a little bit better as well. You scroll down to the Mariners. I think I like their four more than any four in baseball, and I like their depth. With Marco Gonzalez and Chris Flexen. You, know, you, you have Luis Castillo, Logan Gilbert, George Kirby, and Robbie Ray as their top four starters. That's right up there with the Mets. It, it really is. And, and you know, if you consider Robbie Ray the four and you just go, you know, one by one, I mean Castillo to Verlander. I give Verlander the edge. Gilbert and Kirby are two 25-year-old studs that just had a better season than what Robbie Ray put up, which is why I had them ahead of Ray on the depth chart, I wouldn't take either of them over Scherzer, though. So because the top two for the Mets is better, and maybe the fourth starter when you compare Carrasco to any of their four is the one place where the Mariners have an edge, 
I still lean Mets, especially because I like David Peterson and even potentially McGill over Gonzalez and Flexen. They were good enough that I had in three, but still, I have the Mets better than them. Then you go to the Braves. It's the only team I think that you can make the argument that their rotation is better than the Mets. And with the injury to Quintana, maybe it is. Max Fried, Spencer Strider, Kyle Wright as their front three. I think that the Mets have you know, a, a potential edge on the three spot, as great as Kyle Wright was last year. I think Kodai Senga will be better this year. But Freed Strider's about as good as Scherzer Verlander. Morton, Anderson, Soroka, uh, Bryce Elder. Uh, they, they got a lot coming. So, you know, in overall depth, the Braves might take the edge here. We don't know when exactly Soroka is going to be back and healthy. Um, they're hoping early in this season, but this is a guy that's had setback after setback. I think that the Mets can be better. And I had them rank number one when Quintana was out and, and I wasn't expecting him back until at least June. Now it's looking more like July, August. I still think that if we look at the front four of Verlander, Scherzer, Senga, Carrasco, with Verlander, Scherzer, and Carrasco, I feel very confident that you are going to get a lot of starts and a lot of innings pitched, and that is not something a lot of teams can say. To have veterans like that who know how to do the job, I like that for the Mets. Senga has the, the chance to really take this rotation to another level, and I think David Peterson's a guy that can come in this year, turn a lot of heads, Pitch to a low threes ERA. And if you're in a situation where you're sitting, you know, at the all-star break, and Verlander's got a 180 ERA, and Scherzer's at a 2-1, and Senga is pitching out of his mind with a 2-6 ERA. And you know, Carrasco's maybe the one guy that doesn't have the sparkling ERA. He's at 4.2, but he's already won 10 games because that's the way that Carrasco is able to battle every fifth day. And there's a lot of days where he's gonna help you win win a lot of ball games. And then David Peterson sitting at that 3-2. This rotation has a chance to just keep this ball rolling series after series after series. Very similar to how they did last year. I think that Senga could be an improvement over Bassett. I think the fact that you're going to get way more, I believe, out of Verlander and Scherzer than you got out of Scherzer and DeGrom. 101-win team got better with their rotation this year. And to me, the sky is the limit. For what the Mets can do, even without one of the guys that they gave two years and $26 million to this offseason. I hate to say that injury doesn't matter because when other guys go down, it certainly can. But currently, with what the Mets have left, I don't think they're going to be missing Jose Quintana too much. So that will probably wrap up our conversation when it comes to their rotation for this week. We're going to do our Top 20 prospects. I'm going to kick off that list on Friday. So make sure you tune into that episode. Tomorrow's show, we're going to set expectations for Pete Alonzo's season. Continuing our player previews ahead of opening day. We'll go through Pete Alonzo and maybe his MVP chances this year. So make sure you follow, rate, and review to check that out. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, at Ficklestein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets. Your first listen every day, now for your second listen, check out Locked On Fantasy Baseball to help you get ready for all of your leagues, get ready for your drafts. You want to win this year, you got to make sure you're tuning in to Locked On Fantasy Baseball every day, wherever you get your podcasts, and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.